Well, good evening, Eugene. It's wonderful to see you. See all of your beautiful faces here filling this room in this very valuable community resource, Tsunami Books. Independent bookstores like independent information is more and more a rare commodity. So we have to cherish it. We have to protect it. We have to make them grow. I can tell you, coming from Boulder, Colorado, a community relatively similar to uh, Eugene, by the way, you know, big university town and all of that, liberal Dems abound, uh, and, a, and a great community radio station, and you're, you're about to launch, you've launched one, but um, th we don't have a bookstore like this. I mean, it's a real scandal that uh, bookstores all across the country have uh, been literally uh, demolished by the juggernaut of Amazon. And yes, I know you can save a few extra bucks by ordering your books from that loathsome corporation <laughs> in Seattle, but you're talking about keeping your money in the community, and, and that is so valuable. Cherishing community is what we need to do. And um, a special uh, thanks to comrade David Zupan for all the work he's done over so many years uh, around issues of corporate control of media, and now, of course, uh, launching a new radio station, which is in itself... A little closer. A little closer, so okay. You don't have to, so you don't have to did all the government agents turn off their cell phones? Okay, they did. KEPW is community-based and independent and progressive, and it will grow and expand to the extent that you support it. So here's a very concrete thing you can do in your community. You know, that this word community, incidentally, is bandied about in a very promiscuous way, often by big NPR affiliates like KLCC, KOPB, uh, KUOW in Seattle, WGBH in, in Boston, and uh, BUR in Boston, and NYC in New York. But what they want for community, they only want your money when they're asking for it when, yeah. during their pledge drives. Otherwise, it's, you know, good night and good luck. Here you have a community radio station responsive to your needs, which will be as excellent as you make it. So it's, it's a rare thing that you have going, and you can hear alternative radio uh, Tuesday evenings at, at 6, and I think perhaps even on other times, but I know for sure it's on Tuesdays at 6. Well, I was also really inspired by the beautiful music and uh, reminds me how important art is in social struggle. You know, if we're just uh, talking about hard-nosed politics and facts and percentages and, you know, things like that, and we, we do need to talk about them, we need to be careful about our documentation, but we also desperately need art. We need things to lift us out of that quagmire and out of that quicksand and to imagine that another world is possible. The great uh, revolutionary and anarchist Marxist Emma Goldman said, art has the power to make ideas felt. Or if I were Bernie Sanders, ideas. <laughs> art has the power to make ideas felt and indeed it does. So whatever you can do in terms of documentary films, poetry, fiction. Uh, Arundhati Roy of India says that fiction is the greatest truth ever. Uh, and you can you learn so much from fiction. If you read Graham Greene's Quiet American, you understand US imperialism and hubris. Uh, to talk about the British Empire, read Conrad's Heart of Darkness. To understand what happened in the Great Depression, read John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath. There are all of these fabulous books out there. There's so much learning and, to be, and things to be learned. So art plays a crucial role in all of our lives. And remember to laugh. Remember to have a good time. It's not you know, retrograde. It's not retro to have a good time and to laugh and to eat good food. And, and hang out with friends. We need those things. So community is very important. Having you all here this evening is, is not just exciting because the room is you know, full. It's because it's an opportunity for you to meet and make new friends, to connect. You know, it's the epigraph of the uh, novel by E.M. Forster, Howard's End. He says, 
only connect. That's what we need to do. And that's what power doesn't want to happen. They want you isolated in front of your screen or in front of your handheld device and not connecting with people. And it's so important that we build alliances and grow a movement. Poco a poco. It happens one at a time. And of course, you know, we all want to get on the top of K2 or Mount Everest, but we have to start at the base camp. We have to start at the bottom and work, work our way up. So struggling for social change and social justice is not something that happens uh, overnight. You know, just ask the six women who met in Seneca Falls, New York in 1846 who were decrying the uh, pathetic state of women in the United States, you know, and complaining that, you know, we do all the work, we raise the children, we provide our you know, husbands with sex when they demand it, you know, we plant the seeds, we reap the crops, we do all the work, and we have no rights. We don't have the right to vote. We don't have the right to own property. So th that movement started in very, uh, in a very isolated kind of difficult situation, but it grew because people had faith. And when they organized together, that's how movements grow. So this radio station, KEPW, and I'm very happy to tell you that there's a sister station now in Florence, where I'll be speaking tomorrow, KXCR. In fact, uh, some of the Florence people, some of the Florence people are here. These are not small achievements in a time of corporate control of the airwaves, in a time of predatory rapacious capitalism, for communities to organize and to establish independent progressive radio stations is a tremendous achievement. So hats off to the people in Florence and of course uh, here in Eugene. Uh, one of the things I learned from um, my mentor, one of my mentors, Howard Zinn, was to use humor uh, in, you know, whenever giving a talk or, or doing an interview, whatever. And so uh, some years ago, I invented this um, very distinguished, actually, um, award-winning uh, journalist uh, by the name of uh, Dick Veneer. And so uh, Dick would like to present you with a special breaking news broadcast from Tsunami Books in Eugene, Oregon. We interrupt this program to bring you this breaking news story from TIBC, the Truth in Broadcasting Corporation, from our world corporate headquarters in our secure state of the artless corporate headquarters in Roswell, New Mexico, I'm Dick Veneer, your glib and banal anchor of Facade News. The 24-7 newscast dedicated to keeping you in the dark. We go straight to the surface of a story and we stay there. No one can challenge our award-winning, in shallow reporting. We're dedicated to the highest standards of journalism. We make things up as we go along, unencumbered by such elite concepts as the truth. Our award-losing reporters are dedicated to giving you fake news all the time with a thorough and scrupulous disregard for the facts. Our credos, unfair and unbalanced. We deceive. You believe. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, an amazing story coming across our news desk at this very moment. President Donald J. Trump, our exalted leader, has determined that two and two is five. He told Facade News in an exclusive broadcast in the interview that after much soul searching and in consultation with his daughter and son-in-law that he now concludes that long-held views that two and two is four are wrong. He described this amazing discovery while playing golf and called it amazing and unbelievable. Stay tuned for updates on this and other breaking news stories right here on the Facade News Network. I'm Dick Veneer, your still glib and banal news anchor, reminding you, believe our news or else. And now, back to Tsunami Books in Eugene. All right. 
It's great to laugh, you know, it releases a lot of toxins and a lot of things that build up and, you know, it just feels so much better to laugh. Um, Howard Zinn says, we need to engage in whatever nonviolent actions appeal to us. The history of social change is the history of millions of actions, small and large, coming together at critical points to create a power that governments cannot suppress. Zinn was, of course, a towering figure who literally uh, reinvented the way we looked at American history, our own history, which had, until he came along, had always been a story about great men, almost invariably men, incidentally. Great generals, great presidents, great uh, captains of industry. And he told history from the bottom up, from the people who were on the receiving end of the actions and uh, you know, the kind of um, attitudes coming from the rich and the powerful. To be hopeful in bad times, Zinn says, is not just foolishly romantic. It's based on the fact that human history is a history not only of cruelty, but also of compassion, sacrifice, courage, and kindness. What we choose to emphasize in this complex history will determine our lives. If we only see the worst, it destroys our capacity to do something. If we remember those times and places, and there are so many, where people have behaved magnificently, this gives us the energy to act, and at least the possibility of sending this spinning top of a world in a different direction. And if we do act in however small a way, we don't have to wait for some grand utopian future. The future is an infinite succession of presents. And to live now as we think human beings should live in defiance of all that is bad around us is in itself a marvelous victory. Well, a few days ago, uh, the uh, distinguished chief executive of the United States uh, told the former director, well, he was actually the director of the uh, FBI at the time, Jim Comey, that I hope you can see your way clear in letting go, uh, to letting Flynn go. He's talking about his national security advisor, Michael Flynn, who was under investigation by the FBI. He's a good guy, Trump told Comey. I hope you can let this go. Now, if this isn't a clear example of obstruction of justice, I don't know what is. And it's, one hopes that the appointment of um, Bob uh, Mueller will uh, allow for this case to go uh, speedily forward in an expeditious manner because we really can't spend a lot of time with this current uh, junta uh, this current regime. You know, our country is like a banana republic now. You know, remember when we used to laugh at Nicaragua and El Salvador and Honduras? You know, they were like jokes of a country. There was corruption, there was nepotism, there was, you know, backroom deals, there were under the table contract sign. Gee, that sounds like the United States in 2017. And we have become more and more like a banana republic. Uh, elections, which are in, in themselves contested that seem to be highly problematic, where there's, you know, vote fixing, there's suppression of votes, uh, all kinds of chicanery going on, which was, you know, emblematic of those banana republics that we used to feel so good about uh, denouncing and feeling so proud about being a citizen of the United States of America. Well, things have changed uh, over the decades. And of course, the media have a lot to do with shaping people's uh, perceptions, uh, giving them information or not giving them information. In fact, most of the, what the scandal is about the media is what is not reported, not what is reported, what is occluded and excluded rather than what is uh, included and elaborated uh, upon. And so today there's like four or five corporations that control most of the media uh, in the United States. And while the so-called traditional media, the legacy media, is in fact losing um, eyes, they're losing eyeballs and losing ears to um, 
the other, plat other media platforms, you have to get the jargon straight here, other media platforms, still 60% of Americans get their news from TV. From those short newscasts, you know, from David Muir or, you know, who, um, uh, the other news anchors, um, Brian, yeah, S S Scott Simon, Lester Holt, yes, you know them better than I. I try not to, you know, watch them too much, but I have to because I have to monitor what's, what's going on. And that's a, that's a very dangerous situation when so many people are getting the source of information from so few and never in the history of journalism have so many known so little about so much. It's, it's a, it's, and that's why you have 60 million people voting for a charlatan, for a con man, for, some, for a huckster that is a throwback to you know, demagogues of uh, decades ago. Now the media competing for the best hair on the air, these faux journalists are overpaid gas bags, lapdogs with laptops, stenographers. Instead of a press corps, we have a press corpse. They are prostitutes practicing prostitution. They should be taken off the streets. They should be taken off the streets and rehabilitated and given an, an opportunity to practice an honest profession. These st self-styled experts rep represent a range of opinion from A to B. I, I don't even think that's accurate anymore. It's more like A to A squared. A to B is even too much, you know? And so you have, you know, all these pundits from the golden Rolodex of, you know, experts, you know, like Henry Kissinger and uh, Thomas Friedman, Charlie Rose's favorite guests, by the way, the liberal Charlie Rose on the Petroleum Broadcasting Service, uh, the it's brought to you by Coca-Cola, upon, wh upon which Rose actually sits on the board of Coca-Cola. Is that a conflict of interest? Oh, no, it can't possibly be. Uh, and then, you know, there are people like Martha Raddatz and David Brooks and Mark Shields and uh, Wolf Blitzer. It's hard to make up a name like that. He's my favorite. I mean, the other day when um, it was announced that uh, Comey had this document, this, this memo uh, de detailing what Trump had threatened him with. And uh, when that came out, I mean, Br Blitzer adopts his breathless voice, you know, coming right in now, reporters are saying from Washington that the former FBI director, Jim Comey, has secret memorandum d detailing the things that, and he's totally out of breath, as if being out of breath is some kind of a journalistic, uh, you know, talent, and is supposed to convey some urgency to you. But these guys don't think outside the box. I mean, they're very conventional, and also, I think, very poorly uh, trained in terms of a background and history. So when things happen in Kuwait or Iran or Iran, as they say, or Iran or Iraq or Iraq, you know, and places like that, there's no historical context. Things just happen. So you don't learn, you know, why the jihad proliferated uh, from Pakistan in 1979 and 1980 to actually sweep across the world to where there are now Al-Qaeda affiliates uh, under different names and different kinds of uh, tendencies, you know, as far away as Mali uh, and Niger and Nigeria, and in Northeast Africa, in Somalia, in East Africa, all over the Middle East, in Turkey, in Syria, in Iraq. In fact, wherever the US footprint has been placed down, there you have jihad. Can you make the connection? Can the corporate media make that connection between US foreign policy and the spread of violence around the world? Do people like being bombed? Would we re enjoy a drone strike on tsunami books right now, wiping all of us out? Would we find that a pleasant experience? I think not. And so when poor Pakistanis or Afghans or Syrians or Somalis or Libyans are blown to pieces by US drone strikes, 
Hmm, that might create some animosity. That might create some hostility. Make the connection between U.S. foreign policy and U.S. militarism and U.S. aggression and U.S. invasions and occupations. We have over a thousand military bases straddling the globe. But there's no money for Lane Community College. People are being laid off. There's no money for, for student loans. These are the kinds of things that should really agitate a population. And we have to have social change in this country. And it's got to come soon because US imperialism is destroying the planet. The Pentagon itself is the single greatest polluter in the world. The single greatest polluter, all of those F-35s and F-16s and F-18s and F-5s and aircraft carriers and stealth destroyers, Zumwalt stealth destroyers at $4 billion a pop. You think you could use $4 billion in the state of yes. Oregon? Nah, probably not. You know, you'd probably, you know, waste the money. But, you know, how about those $13 billion a pop Ford aircraft carriers, which are delivered, you know, behind schedule with all kinds of, you know, cost overruns and deficient uh, working uh, mechanisms. We have a Pentagon that is suffocating the budget. It's, it's literally pulling all of the oxygen out of the atmosphere. And then we are left with the crumbs. The ruling class, the owners of the country, the, For the Forbes 400, the Fortune 500, and the plutocrats, they give us a few crumbs and they expect their hands to be kissed. We're supposed to bow down in front of them. Well, I'm not going to do it and you're not going to do it. And these radio stations that have just started in Florence and in Eugene are not going to do it. It's time to fight back. We have to resist militarism. We have to call a spade a spade. U.S. foreign policy is not about the fairy tales that these pathetic anchors, you know, spin out. And why are they called anchors? Because they're anchored to power. That's why they're called anchors. So the fairy tales about bringing democracy to benighted and backward people, liberating them, bringing them the glory of the free market and open trade and, and stuff like that, that's all BS. I mean, that's all propaganda. We have to be able to see through that and talk about imperialism because that is the guiding force of U.S. foreign policy. And behind that imperialism, of course, is the military. That's the muscle that enforces the, the imperialism. And so when the corporations go after the resources around the world, from lithium, from copper, to bauxite, to iron ore, to oil, to all the other uh, minerals, they've got this enormous military as, as a muscle to kind of enforce their will. That cannot continue. All things will end. This empire will end. And it's up to us to see how that will happen. Will it disintegrate into civil war and massive discord? Or will th is another world possible, as Arundhati Roy likes to ask the question, where there is peace and social justice and e eco-justice uh, for particularly the poor around the globe? And behind this, of course, all of this is the system itself, which is capitalism, which they love to call the free market, as if it's free. It's not free. It's an enslaved market that depends heavily on taxpayer intervention. Without it, there's hardly a sector of this economy that could function without taxpayer support. You take from the avionics, you know, in, in the planes, the internet, Pharmaceuticals, all of these vaccines and cures that are invented and drugs that are developed at the National Institutes of Health, which we own, which we the people pay for, somehow, you know, after all this research is done, they f those amazing pharmaceutical breakthroughs find themselves in the hands of these gigantic corporations who then charge us an arm and a leg for, you know, simple drugs that should be uh, much less expensive. So speaking clearly and identifying things, if we learned anything from Orwell, it's that. It's about speaking clearly and identifying things by their rightful names. But he also acknowledged that he said that sometimes the thing that's right in front of your nose is the hardest thing to see. 
So if we're not taught about imperialism in school, if we're only taught about the fairy tales of U.S. enlightenment and wanting to, you know, uh, make the world safe for democracy and it's, you know, full of benign intentions, uh, even women's liberation, which is the most remarkable thing, uh, you have uh, the exalted leader about to go to the most misogynist regime on the face of the earth, Saudi Arabia. Do you think he'll bring up women's rights? Do you think he'll bring up divorce or owning property, which women cannot, you know, don't have access to in Saudi Arabia? They don't even, in rare cases, do they ever get uh, children in... Um, in custody cases, the children always go to the husband. The husband rules. This is a country that internally is incredibly feudalistic and externally has been responsible for bankrolling the jihad, starting in Pakistan in 1979, 1980. That's where the Taliban came from. They exported their extreme version of Islam, which is called Wahhabism, named after a a 17th century uh, Saudi, there was no Saudi Arabia then, but someone from the Arabian Peninsula named Muhammad al-Wahhab. He had an absolutely strict interpretation of the Quran. No prisoners. It's my way or the highway. And that's that kind of intolerant Islam that has been exported to Pakistan, to Afghanistan, to Syria, to Libya, and many other countries around uh, the world. Fifteen of the 19 hijackers, as you know, were from Saudi Arabia. Did we bomb Saudi Arabia? What was the first country to be attacked? Afghanistan. Arguably was not involved. I mean, people may have carried out the operation or directed it from Afghan soil, but the Afghan people were not involved, and certainly the Afghan state was not involved. And that war continues 16 years after it started with no end in sight. This afternoon, I spoke at Lane Community College, you know, looking out at the faces of, you know, some teenagers in that office, they, in that audience. They have grown up it, with the con constant soundtrack of war in the background. That has become the new normal. The United States is at war in Libya, in Somalia, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Syria, in Mali, in Niger, in a whole host of countries where the U.S. carries out its uh, you know, terror attacks, and particularly in Yemen, to circle back to Saudi Arabia. Yemen is the poorest country of 22 Arab countries. It is probably the first country to run out of fresh water in the world. It's incredibly destitute. There's starvation going on right now. And Saudi Arabia continues to pummel the country with bombing attacks and has enforced a naval blockade. So that doesn't allow food to come in and medicines to come in for, the, for a desperate population. Do you think the exalted leader will bring this up with Prince Salman uh, when he meets him in Riyadh? I don't think so. What they're going to talk about is securing a hundred billion dollar arms deal. Because that's the essential function of the President of the United States, to be the CEO of corporate capitalism, particularly when it comes to arms sales. I remember when I was in, the last time I was in India, well that was some years ago since I'm banned from India, but I was there when Obama showed up with about 200 CEO of the top CEOs, and it became very clear what was going on. He was there to enable deals to be made with U.S. corporations, uh, also with you know, these uh, in, uh, obscenely called public-private partnerships. It's usually, which means in English, if we make money, we keep it. If the partnership loses money, you, the public, go in and cover it. That's public partner, again, speaking truth to power and decoding the propaganda, you know, is an essential part of the kind of work that independent journalists uh, should be doing and are doing. So Saudi Arabia has a lot to answer for, and, you know, this goes way back to 1945 when FDR made a deal with Ibn Saud to protect the kingdom of Saudi Arabia in return for unfettered U.S. corporate access 
to the Saudi oil fields and to allow the building of, of U.S. military bases in Saudi Arabia. So that was the Faustian bargain. It's not about democracy. It's not about freedom. It's not about women's rights. It's all about realpolitik. It's all about militarism and extending the uh, global reach of U.S. Uh, corporations. I'd like to see some of that money and some of that energy go back right here in our country where so many things desperately need to be addressed. We could, we could start with our $1.4 trillion student debt, which is literally choking students and their parents and their grandparents. I mean, I meet, I meet people, young people all over the country who are just struggling to make ends meet at, and, and in order to pay off uh, this enormous burden. It's no wonder that Bernie Sanders today is the most popular politician in the United States, particularly among young people. Yeah. Yeah. No. And last year, socialism was the most looked up word on Google. No. And I think we have this 75-year-old white-haired man from Brooklyn, New York, who represents the small state of Vermont with a population of 600,000, to thank for that interest in socialism. Another world is possible. We can do something about climate change if we act collectively. It cannot be done one-offs, you know. We cannot just have, uh, let's say, uh, Bulgaria has a great, you know, climate change uh, program and is doing great innovative things. It has to be collective. It requires that kind of uh, socialistic outlook that we re we're in this together. So what do we have going on here? We have someone who's threatening to leave the Paris Treaty. We have someone who calls climate change a hoax invented by the Chinese in order to undermine US manufacturing. That was a real laugh. I mean, that whole sentence, if you just heard what I said. <laughs> Donald Trump says climate change is a hoax, as well as his EPA administra administrator, uh, Mike Mulvaney, his budget uh, guy, chief of the, of the budget, they, they say the same thing. And Trump added that it was a hoax invented by the Chinese in order to undermine U.S. manufacturing. U.S. manufacturing has been undermined by U.S. corporations, not Chinese corporations. It's these guys sitting in the suites in New York and in Seattle and in Portland who have exported the jobs in order to maximize uh, their own short-term uh, profits. Again, it's right in front of us if we had a media telling these stories, people would have a greater understanding of what's going on and who benefits from this uh, predatory capitalist economy, which is now, you know, in somewhat disarray because of the instability uh, evidenced uh, in the White House. Yesterday there was a, um, what, a three or four hundred point drop in um, the stock market, which leads me to believe that sooner or later, probably sooner, uh, the ruling class, the people who own the country, are going to turn against Trump. Uh, there's already signs of that. You see that in some of the establishment uh, newspapers, uh, columns like, you know, David Brooks, George Will. These are not radical people. Uh, senators like McCain and uh, Lindsey Graham and uh, even the guy from Nebraska is saying some remarkable things. Uh, Sasser, I think, is his name. Because they need stability. Why did Nixon fall? Not because he broke into uh, Watergate. Not because he uh, had Daniel Ellsberg's uh, psychiatrist's office uh, broken into. Not because he wiretapped wiretap people. Because the ruling class lost confidence in his ability to run the system on their behalf. They need a competent manager so that the capitalist gains and accumulations will continue unimpeded. And I think that's what's going to turn on uh, the 45th uh, president. And alternative radio, which I started in, uh, in 86, but actually goes back to 78 when I was a volunteer at a community radio station in Boulder, which is still there, my home station, uh, KGNU, is now, you know, 
on about 250 radio stations. It's a chronicle of dissent, of movements. It exemplifies the founding principles of public broadcasting in this country. If you go back to the Public Broadcasting Act of 1967, it's a pretty radical document if you actually read it. Most people you know, don't have access to it. It was the last piece of great society legislation that LBJ pushed through. And then his whole administration went up in flames in the debacle in Indochina. But in that uh, legislation, the principle of public broadcasting in this country is to give voice to those who may otherwise be unheard, to be a forum for controversy and debate. Those are direct quotes. When you turn on NPR, okay, liberal NPR, I know a lot of you listen to it. What kind of debates do you hear? Well, there are oppos opposing points of view. You get retired Len Len you know, Lieutenant General Walla Wale Wallam, and then you get uh, retired Major General uh, you know, Joe uh, Kuczynski, and they talk about, well, we need to ramp up our military presence in Afghanistan. So then the debate becomes, how do you do that? How many more troops? And then one will say, well, I think we need 5,000 more special ops troops. No, the other one says 3,000. And that's the debate. Where is the voice saying, why are we in Afghanistan? What right does the United States have to invade and occupy and brutalize another country? Those questions cannot be asked. They, it, they don't even occur to the uh, journalists at Some Things Considered. Some. <laughs> Just now, we were, we were driving over here. Sorry, I couldn't, I didn't, I don't have a bike, so we were driving over here. And we were listening to uh, um, an obituary for Roger Ailes. You know, yeah. This, you know, this major misogynist and racist, you know, who introduced the Willie Horton ad in 1988. A straight out racist attack against people of color, you know, to scare people. That wasn't even mentioned in his, you know, in this pretty, I would say, antiseptic, um, you know, description of his life. You know, he was a great innovator. Uh, he took Fo Fox News to the top of, of the ratings. Uh, there were some complications uh, hinted at only that there were some problems with some of his female employees. And that was it. It was a complication. It was like, you know, what? You know, imagine that. Someone molesting and harassing women be simply because he has a position of power is given that kind of free ride on national propaganda radio. I mean NPR, National Public Radio, which is, has more and more shifted to the right, like elites in this country, and they're in lockstep with many of the elites. And that's why you have you know, things like what happened with alternative radio at KLCC uh, and at other stations ar around the country uh, as well. Morning edition, I call M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. <laughs> I'm in mourning whenever I hear morning edition. Nevertheless, nevertheless I read it. I, lis I, I listen to it because I want to know what they are saying. This, these are elite voices intended for elite audiences, and I want to know what the lines are. You know, it's easy to, you know, dismiss Fox as, you know, over the top and extreme. But it's, you know, it's NPR with its very smooth talking, uh, almost uh, glib and banal uh, interviewers who, you know, so good to see you again, Michael. Good to be back with you, David. It's always a pleasure. Uh, you know, people speak in complete sentences. Uh, there's no yelling. There seems to be a command of adverbs even. Anyone? <laughs> No, there are few, few older people here remember adverbs, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. So, so it's very seductive. You know, there's no yelling. Sentences are spoken. You know, complete sentences, subject, verbs, adverbs, adjectives, all in the right place. And so we get lulled to sleep by that. But I think you know we should hold it to a much higher standard. And it has moved far away from the founding principles of public broadcasting in this country to give voice to those who may otherwise be unheard. When was the last time you heard Noam Chomsky on national public radio? Yeah. Or on PBS? I mean, he is, he is somewhat of a major figure. 
no, no matter what you may think of him. He is universally regarded as the premier U.S. Uh, critic of the media and foreign policy and, you know, a major intellectual. So you would think, you know, like once in a while he might be on. He was on the snooze hour. Uh, back in those days it was called the McNeil era snooze hour, news hour. Once in 1999. And why was he on? Because he had published an, uh, an essay saying that uh, the U.S. was closely allied with Saddam Hussein, that Iraq had legitimate territorial claims on Kuwait, and that Kuwait was siphoning off uh, Iraqi oil for, because of uh, slant drilling. Okay, well, that was nowhere to be found in the news, and I was pretty you know, excited that they were having Chomsky on. And what did they do? They cut him off. He was literally cut off. You can find this on the internet. Just go back. It was September 1990. So right a, a month after uh, Iraq invaded Kuwait, uh, Chomsky's on, and they just cut him off. And so what that, what that means, I mean, it's not just an example of censorship. If you're arguing counter-hegemonic ideas, if you're putting forth uh, information that's not in the mainstream, that is not, you know, uh, available to everyone. That requires some explication. It requires some space. You need to give examples. You need to give history. And this is where the corporate media completely collapse. Things just happen. Muslims are crazy. Their holy book is, you know, promotes violence. It's in their genes. It's a millennial old conflict. What rubbish. <laughs> they keep talking about Israel and Palestine, millennial ancient hatreds. These are not ancient hatreds. These are recent issues that are a direct result of imperialism. For example, this year, 2017, is the 100th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration, in which His Majesty's government, in all her Downton Abbey you know, glory, you know, bequeathed to the Jewish people a homeland in Palestine. Like they were giving away the deed to a land that they did not own to another party that was not present on that land except in very small numbers at that time in 1917. Uh, the year before that, you had the Sykes-Picot Agreement. I'm sure I don't have to tell this audience, right? You know all about Sykes-Picot. Sykes-Picot. Sykes was a Mar Sir Mike, sorry, Sir Mark Sykes was a high uh, official in the British uh, Foreign Office, and uh, Georges uh, uh, Picot was an equivalent um, official in the French Foreign Ministry. There's a little hint of this in Lawrence of Arabia, the movie. I don't know if any of you have seen that, where um, I forget the na the actor who played uh, um, he. He played the French officer in, um, in Casablanca who uh, said, uh, sh I'm shocked, I'm shocked. Remember, who, what's his name? <laughs> eh? No one, no one remembers? Claude Rains, thank you very much. All right, give that person a glass of free water. Awesome. So he's, he's this character where they're you know, hinting at there's some dirty deals going on between the British that they were going to sell out the Arabs. They had seduced the Arabs to rise up against the Turks and to fight against them in return for freedom and independence after the war. Well, we know how that deal turned out for the Arabs. They got it up to here uh, with you know, British occupation of uh, Iraq, uh, French occupation of Syria and Lebanon, the creation of Jordan, which didn't even exist at the time, uh, and, the, uh, and British control over uh, Palestine. Without knowledge of history, it's impossible to know what's going on today. And if we had a media doing its job, it would provide that background. I'm not, I'm not saying it has to provide, you know, the extreme minutiae of what has happened, but there are reasons things happen. And so without that information, it does seem this is random violence. These people are crazy. They're just wild. They want to kill us. You know, why do they hate America? Well, George Bush told us because of our freedoms. Oh, really? Not because of our foreign policy? Not because of all our military bases? Not because of destroying democracy in Iran in 1953? Not because of overthrowing uh, governments in, in Lebanon and Iraq and Syria and elsewhere? None of that? Maybe not. 
Well, I think, you know, we cannot be hoodwinked any longer. And as Orwell said, those who control the present control the past. Those who control the past control the future. We need to be better informed. And that's the role of an independent progressive media, delivering news and information to you that you can use, that puts things in context, that gives you a background and a history for why things are happening. And so the media, you know, the five W's that you all learn if you go to journalism school, the who, what, where, when, and why, they kind of get the first four W's somewhat okay. But on the fifth one, it's a complete failure. The why. There is never any explanation, and there is never any connection with U.S. Policy. The U.S. policy, whether it's Democrat or Republican, when it comes to imperialism, it is consistent and it is constant. A perfect example of that was when the um, Trump launched 49 Tomahawk missiles made by Raytheon, which Trump has shares in, so no conflict of interest there. Raytheon stocks went up the next day because, you know, using weapons, you got to buy new weapons. It's a, it's a great system. Um, Trump said at the time that, uh, you know, this was going to protect us from, uh, you know, the Syrians and it was retribution for a putative uh, gas attack. Yes, maybe uh, other more horrible things uh, have happened. But what happened in, the, in this particular case where you had uh, Syria, a designated enemy, uh, committing crimes and Trump getting his, you know, uh, kind of a distraction from other issues going on in Washington, launches this cruise mis uh, this Tomahawk missile attack. 47 out of 48 newspapers in the country endorsed the attack. I mean, you have to go back to, to the Stalin era in the Soviet Union to get that kind of unanimity among, you know, in the media. Amazing. When it comes to violence, when it comes to imperial violence, they're all on board. And this is a constant between Democrats and Republicans. We can't say that the Democrats are less violent or less likely to you know, engage in military action. You may feel that way, but the historical record simply does not support it. So we have to, as I said today, at some point, start a second party here in the United States. I mean, how many times are we going to be taken out and left to hang and dry by the Democratic Party? How many times must we, you know, learn the bitter lesson that they're part of the problem? They are dedicated to this system. Yes, there are some tactical differences, but they are not substantive when it comes to policies like imperialism and the kind of rapacious predatory capitalism uh, that we have. Thomas Merton uh, in his book, Seeds of Destruction, writes, a falsely informed public with a distorted view of political reality and an oversimplified negative attitude towards other races and peoples cannot be expected to react in any other way than with irrational and violent responses. And that speaks right to the role of the media in shaping and, and f forming uh, public opinion about uh, various issues. It's kind of interesting. I have to confess I'm a hypocrite just denouncing the capitalist system and then la lapsing, uh, segueing right into a sales pitch. You know. it's, it's, uh, so there, there are four new, four new programs, four one-hour programs, Vandana Shiva on eco-social justice, David Corton on ecological civilization, Kashama Sawant, this remarkable woman in uh, Seattle who was elected on the Socialist Party ticket to the C Seattle C City Council in 2013, elected again just a year ago to the City Council. The first socialist to be elected in Seattle since 1916. Brilliant, articulate, sharp as a tack, someone that can inspire all of us in terms of fighting for social justice. So, and her program is called What It Takes to Win. And finally, Kali Okuno. This is one of the great things, if I may say, that I try and do at Alternative Radio, is to find those voices that are unknown, like Kali Okuno, uh, who is a community rights organizer in Jackson, Mississippi. 
Just think about that for a second, what it's like to organize and work in Jackson. We live in privileged communities, kindred spirits, you know, lots of liberal uh, sympathies and, and trajectories. He is in one of the, not only one of the poorest cities in the poorest state in the country, but one of the most racist cities uh, in the United States. And he's there organizing. He's not just talking about and complaining, but actually doing something. So that's, that's the key thing here, to move from talking about doing something to doing something. Like those six women in, in Seneca Falls, New York. Like Rosa Parks in Montgomery, Alabama. Like throughout history when social change has happened. It's always been, as Margaret Mead said, a few people that have gotten together that have made social change possible. So when you get together finding kindred spirits, it's so important that you act, that you mobilize yourselves, that you save depression for better times. People ask me, don't you get depressed, David? You're dealing with all this horrible material. You're talking about these incredible war crimes and atrocities and, you know, the, the, the raping of the earth, the, you know, the uh, eco-crisis and, and yeah, I say yeah, but you know, I'm going to save despair and depression, the depression for when we are winning. Then I might kick back and relax and put my feet up and feel depressed. But I don't have the right. We do not have the right, particularly people of privilege, and we are people of privilege. We are positioned to make social change happen, much more than say people in Jackson, Mississippi, who don't have the advantages that we have. Okay, we're getting close to the end. That's a, an applause line. I know, you've been very patient. Uh, I want to talk about, I want to remind you about some of these titans we have in our history and the lessons that we can learn from them. I just mentioned uh, Rosa Parks, for example. But Frederick Douglass was such a titan. I guess, unintended pun here with Lane Community College, right? <laughs> the, the titans, okay. He said on August 4th, 1857, this is an excerpt from a talk he gave on West India emancipation. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom yet deprecate agitation are men and women who want crops without plowing the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the roar of its mighty waters. The struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, or it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has, and it never will. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has, and it never will. We have to get off of Facebook and into the face of the creeps in the suites who rule over us. We have to melt them with the noise we make and get them out of those suites and rock up their comfort zones. So if it's attending town meetings, if it's going to Salem to protest, if it's going to Washington DC to march, do what you can, get in community groups like 350.org, like uh, Code Pink, like the other organizations you have here in the city, like the one uh, represented by Michael here, which is called Cal. Cal. C-A-L. C-A-L-C. Calc. Thank you. See Michael, he has a sign-up sheet. You can do something right here in your community. Marge Piercy is one of my favorite um, writers, and uh, she's a great leftist, by the way. Uh, you can read her poetry in Monthly Review, which is an excellent source of information. Uh, she's got a couple of poems. I've often read The Moon is Always Female, The Low Road, here in uh, Eugene. So I'm going to read you her latest poem, or one of her latest poems, called We Give Up Far Too Easily. Why do people get so discouraged about political action? You take vitamin pills and imagine they do something. You don't say, I'll never wash dishes again because they'll just get dirty. We all mumble silly prayers into the air. Oh, please don't let me miss the plane or the bus. Oh, please let him or her call me back. We never count times our wishes deflate as futile. Inaction certainly will work fine for the overlords who own our work. Inaction certainly will work fine for the overlords who own our work, control our lives, consider us 
collateral damage in their grand schemes. They only fear masses in action. They only fear masses in action. A little at a time is the way forward, an unending dance, two steps forward, one and a half steps backwards. Sitting on your ass too long just makes you one. We're only what we've tried. Marge Piercy. Now, I, I want to take you out of your cultural zone for a second and move you, transport you, hopefully, to South Asia, to the greatest Urdu poet of the 20th century, Faiz Ahmed Faiz. Uh, he was born in Sialkot in Punjab in British India in 1911. It's kind of unusual. His first name and last name are the same, F-A-I-Z. You can look him up. An extraordinary uh, poet. He was a trade unionist and proud of it, a journalist and proud of it. He was a communist and proud of it. He was put in one of the many jails uh, that uh, US-backed military dictators in Pakistan had, and he was proud of serving uh, in jail. And he was the greatest Urdu poet of the 20th century. Urdu is an amalgam of uh, Farsi and Arabic and Hindi and Punjabi and a, a bunch of other North Indian and West Asian uh, language. It's, it's particularly uh, expressive. And this is his most famous poem. So you're going to learn a word now in, in Urdu and Hindi. And that word is bol, B-O-L. It's the imperative, speak. So when you go to demonstrations in Pakistan or even in Nepal or Bangladesh and of course in North India, you see placards, you see signs everywhere with these three letters, bowl. People know what it is, they know the poem. Bol, bol ke lab azad hai tere, bol zaban ab tak teri hai. Speak, your lips are free. Speak, your tongue is still yours. Speak, your life is still yours. Speak, there is little time. But little though it is, it is enough time. Enough before the body perishes, before the tongue atrophies. Speak, the truth still lives. Say what you have to say. Speak, your lips are free. Bol, bol, bol. All right, I'm, now I'm going to try a little experiment. I hope you'll indulge me in a bit of hip-hop, actually. Uh, one of the greatest artists of modern times, in my view, is Gil Scott Heron. Uh, you've, you've heard of The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, but I mean, all of you know, Whitey on the Moon. You go back to reading his poems. I mean, he is the progenitor of the hip-hop movement, of rap. You know, they all kind of see him as that fountain of wisdom that launched uh, the possibility of doing this radical form of uh, presentation. And I don't know if I can do it. I certainly cannot do it like uh, Gil Scott Heron. But uh, this is set, this poem, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, uh, is set to A Night in Tunisia, a great bebop classic. The revolution will not be televised. You'll not be able to stay home, brothers. You'll not be able to plug in, turn it on, and cop out. You'll not be able to lose yourself on Star Trek reruns, skip out for beer during commercials, because the revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be brought to you by J.P. Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, Citicorp, and Bank of America in four parts without commercial interruptions. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be brought to you by CBS, PBS, and MSN, MSNBC, CNN, NPR, or ABC, and starring Julia Roberts and Tom Hanks. The revolution will not give your mouth sex appeal. The revolution will not get rid of zits. The revolution will not make you look five pounds thinner because the revolution will not be televised, brothers and sisters. The revolution will not be sung by Adele, Lady Gaga, Taylor Swift, or Justin Bieber. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be right back after a message about white out, white chocolate, or white people. You not have to worry about a dove in your bedroom, a tiger in your tank, or a giant in the toilet bowl. The revolution will not go better with Coke, or Pepsi, or Diet 7 Up, or Stripe, or Sprite, or Dad's Root Beer. The revolution will not fight the germs that may cause bad breath. The revolution will put you in the driver's seat. The revolution will not be televised, will not be televised, will not be televised. 
televised. The revolution will be no reruns, brothers and sisters. The revolution will be live on Alternative Radio and KEPW in Eugene. You can do it. We can do it. Bold. Bold. Exactly. Speak. So, uh, do we have time for some... David, you're the host, director. We're fine with time. Is there a microphone for audience questions? Uh, there is not yet. There could be possibly. Possibly. Okay, well, uh, you'll have to speak up. Yes? sound the way you heard it, it's our time to speak up and call the broadcaster, say, this is not the way I heard it, and get other people to do the same, because if you don't call up, nothing happens. If you don't call up, nothing happens. I, I want to say a, a word about boycotts and as a very effective uh, political tool. There is a, a boycott divestment sanctions movement now in the country uh, that has scored some you know, minor successes, but it is growing. You know, this is the 50th anniversary of the Six Day War, 50 years of occupation of Palestine, the longest military occupation in modern times. And the BDS movement is pushing back and is making great inroads and is making the Israeli government very nervous, by the way. Uh, I just did a program with uh, Max Blumenthal who happens to be the son of Sidney Blumenthal, a very prominent Clinton uh, Democrat, on uh, Palestine, 50 years of uh, occupation. 50 years have passed since Israel's victory in the Six Day War, resulting in the longest military occupation in modern times. On the ground, there's been a radical shift in demographics because of the settlements. What began as a few scattered outposts has mushroomed into vast subdivisions and cities with Jewish-only road networks making it difficult for Palestinians to travel. About 600,000 Israelis now live beyond the country's 1967 borders. The Palestinians are squeezed into ever smaller isolated enclaves without sufficient water. The settlements, illegal under international law, are key to the resolution of the conflict. But Israel continues to build them and expand. Each new house reduces the possibility of a just peace. And Ma Washington makes it all possible. Yep. It cannot be done without the military, economic, and diplomatic support coming from the United States. When that changes, the situation on the ground will change and the possibilities of peace will emerge, in my view. So calling up... Uh, you know, stations is important, but also think about, you know, how to hurt them economically. You know, call the advertisers. Now, we saw the impact, what happened with O'Reilly. Uh, once these, uh, you know, all of these charges were made by various people, and this, this has been going on for years. I mean, he was involved in sexual allegation and harassment charges uh, at least a decade ago, maybe even 20 years ago, I remember uh, incidents involving uh, O'Reilly, but it was when Mercedes-Benz and the, you know, the big advertisers started pulling out that Fox said, hey, we're going to lose money on this guy. It's time to let him go. And that's what happened. So they understand one thing. I mean, the, the capitalists have got one thing going for them, and that's this, money. This is what they understand. And when you're able to leverage some kind of economic damage on them, they listen. It has an impact. Abolish capitalism! <laughs> <laughs> yes? You know, uh, on alternative media, an idea whose time has come was spread by itself because it's useful to people. And so one of our shortfalls, we don't have enough ideas that really will take off. And I think that, as you mentioned, we need a, a second party. I think we should talk up the idea of abolishing the United States. And that can happen as soon as we establish new regional-sized countries. So we need a nationwide movement to abolish the United States. Yay. Okay. I mean, these things, I mean, uh, and um, abolish capitalism. Okay, let's start, you know, a, some kind of socialist uh, alternative. Uh, we have to build from the bottom. We have to create 
cadres and cohorts and we have to educate our population so they understand what these terms mean. Right now they're awash in propaganda, much of it pejorative and negative. So we have to rescue language or create new language and we have to, you know, extend our hand to people. Someone asked me today, what do you do with, you know, some of some of these fervent Trump supporters. How do you turn them around? Why did 60 million people vote for Donald J. Trump? Well, first of all, it's, it's a tribute or a lack of tribute to the collapse of neoliberalism, which has created the greatest transfer of wealth in the history of the world. Judge Louis Brandeis, who was appointed to the Supreme Court by uh, FDR, actually, uh, said that you can have two things. You can have a democracy or you can have great wealth, but you cannot have both. And that's where we are going, moving into an oligarchy, moving into more and more of a banana republic. So we have a lot of work to do. And how do you talk to people? Do you talk ex cathedra to them? Hey, I'm so smart, man. I am so cool. I know everything. I know alpha to omega, the ins and outs, and you're a blithering idiot. You're a fool. Is that a way I'm going to win you over? And too many people on the left for too long have talked to people like that. I'm so smart. I'm so cool. No, you're not. You know, you're, you're, you're in this body with all the foibles that come with that. Yes? What about our original native nations? Like what about our original native nations? Well, there's so much, so much to learn. I talked quite a bit about that this afternoon, actually. But uh, learning from indigenous cultures of course, again, is part of, I think, the solution. Uh, Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz uh, has a, you know, a terrific program on alternative radio called An Indigenous Economic Model, how native societies organize their communities around the common ground, around you know, common ownership. There wasn't private ownership of the stream. The community owned it. There wasn't private ownership of the fields. It was owned by the community. It was the commons. So that is, of course, something that you know, we could emulate. And it was uh, Chief Seattle who may or may not have said, it doesn't matter, it's the truth. He noticed among the white settlers that there was, they had a tremendous passion for uh, acquisition, for material wealth to put up their names on posts and declare this is their property, this belongs to me. And uh, ultimately, he said, if you keep soiling the bed you sleep in, you will choke on your own toxic fumes. And that's exactly what's happening today with climate change, where the planet is under tremendous stress and is in a dangerous position uh, that it has not seen in, we don't know for how long, I mean for millennia. Species are being extinct, did, if I could use that, uh, at, a, at a record pace. And it's not just about these cute peng penguins and polar bears and monarchs, yes, I love them all. Ultimately, it's going to be about us. Human life itself is under threat because of this runaway system that sees Mother Nature as a dumpster, you know, or, or a giant mine to extract wealth from. So we, we have to have a radical transformation of views, how we see nature, how we see our mother. If our mother were being attacked, we would defend her, right? It's only logical. Our mother is under attack by this system that is driven by one thing and one thing only, profits. It's profits over people, it's profits over nature, and until and unless that changes, we are putting the planet and ourselves in great jeopardy. <coughs> yeah. parties, one uh, with the emotional appeal, another with the more rational. You've been a bit more on the rational, analytical side. But if you were to appeal to people who are not here, people who still voted for the major parties, is there something that you would find as the most emotionally stirring in the population for, in the right way, not the 
fear and everything, but like the rights of future generations, or the inequality and the abuse of poor people, or what would you find the most emotionally stirring to the mainstream that would bring us to justice? Well, I think workers getting ripped off by the, by the bosses, by the captains of industry who have created such distortions in the, in the economy, the greatest transfer of wealth in the history of capitalism has been shooting up to the 1%, actually we should talk about the one-tenth of 1%, 1 which has monopolized most of the income gains. People have been working, productivity is as high as ever in the United States, but wages have absolutely gone flat. They're basically what they were in 1979. If you were working a full-time job then, allowing for infl inflation and other economic factors, and working the same job in, in 2017, you'd be earning the exact same amount of money. Meanwhile, your health care has gone through the roof. Meanwhile, you cannot, cannot afford prescription drugs. Meanwhile, you know, the environment's going to hell. There are all kinds of other, you know, you cannot find affordable housing. I don't know about Eugene, but, you know, in, in Boulder, where I live, you know, an apartment the size of the bathroom in the back there rents for $1,500. You know, and there might be a bunk bed. So, you know, there's huge crises and needs here in the country itself about a common ground. Where can we find common ground? I argue this all over the country and in Canada. I'm going there next week and around the world. I was in Jordan uh, two weeks ago. Do people want clean air? Do they want clean water? Do they want healthy, nutritious food that's not laden with GMOs and additives and preservatives? The answer, brothers and sisters, comrades, is universally yes. That's not a liberal question. You ask any mother, do you want their child to eat nutritious food? Do you want a park that is clean, that has a playground for them to play in? It's a no-brainer. So there are areas where I think we can achieve major breakthroughs and, you know, and save discussions about predatory rapacious capitalism for later. But let's start. <laughs> Well, they feel they're getting ripped off, and they're right. They are right. There, there is that feeling, you know, and that's, and that's what Bernie tapped into, the inequality. And then, you know, Trump with his demagoguery, like all demagogues, you know, appealing to people's fears and vulnerabilities, you know, and then like Joseph Goebbels, you know, just have a few slogans, make America great again, build the wall, lock her up, any others? There, was, there, was, there were three or four repeated over, crooked Hillary. How many times did you hear that? These went into the collective aqu aquifer. You know, it, it was classic Nazi propaganda technique. I mean, Hitler would have been very impressed. You take a few, a few tropes and you repeat them over and over again. And it had, a, it had an impact. So why did the people on the left do that also? Counteract that. To counter, I mean, with our rhetoric? Well, whatever catchphrase would get people's attention, they, just, they didn't do it. They didn't fight back. You know, they just like well, Bernie did. did. Yeah, Bernie did. certainly yeah, did. The, yeah. the, 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 the Democrat hierarchy obviously didn't want, want him to be the nominee, and he wasn't. So Hillary didn't do that. You know, more people voted against Hillary than wanted her to win. Well, actually, she got three million more votes. Vote yeah. All, but ultimately, you know, no. the, the base of the Democratic Party did not want her. Eight million Obama voters didn't show up yeah. or voted for uh, Trump. The Democratic Party failed the people. And this is a kind of giant FU middle finger right up the establishment. Even people voting against their interests. Those people in Wisconsin and Michigan, I'm sure they, many of them know the reality of what Trump represents. You know, putting their faith in a real estate billionaire, a Shylock, you know, a crook, uh, to, to think that that would be transformative shows you how deeply wounded the working class is in this country. And the Democrats had bupkis for them. Any Yiddish speakers here? Bupkis, it's the snot of a goat. In other words, nothing. One more. Oh, one more. I'll do it. 
Uh, yes, I, I wanted, the representative from Bend. Yeah, yeah, I'm from way out there. But I just wanted to share a couple ideas about community radio because we have a really good one in Bend and two things that we're doing right now. One is uh, several of us got together and <clears throat> we read the poem by uh, Langston Hughes that he wrote in 1935 as a direct contradiction to make America great again. Yeah. So you might want to do that and get it out to your people. And the other thing we're doing is setting up a program, an interview program, uh, with people in the community, not uh, organizers, not experts, none of that, no foreigners coming in to tell us, and uh, addressing an issue like health care or whatever, and uh, having the people who are directly impacted in our community by that, uh, by that process. So it's a direct impact on you. And so you get to come and have an interview where you get to talk. So you might consider that sort of thing. It's not all that difficult. If we can do it, you can do it. And the poem is great. So if you haven't read it, read it. Can you, can you give us the name of the poem again? The poem is Let America Be America Again. And it was written by Langston Hughes. I think it was 1935. Yep. And it's beautiful. And uh, yeah, and it's right on. Thank you very much. And don't forget, support Tsunami Books, support KEPW, support Community Radio. You can do it. We can do it together. Onward.